Today we're discussing domain and range, so please turn to page 7 of the required course modules. By the end of today's lesson, you're going to be expected to be able to find the domain and the range of a function, express the domain and the range of a function in multiple ways, and there's one missing objective, so if you have the first version of the modules, you need to add this in. You will also be able to graph and evaluate piecewise functions. So let's start off with some key terms. The first is domain. The domain is the set of all real input values which do not cause an undefined operation. So again, the set of all real input values um, which do not cause an undefined operation. If you're curious what an undefined operation is, things like dividing by zero or negative square root, negative radicands in a square root. Next, let's define the range. The range is the complete set of all possible values. Well, all possible output values. Typically, these are the y values. So these y values are obtained by substituting all possible x values into a function. Okay, so with that, we need to do a little bit of notation review. Hopefully, this rings a bell from algebra, and if it doesn't, that is all right. This is why we do review. So let's look down here at our notation review, and I'm going to end up covering the definitions. So this first row of the table is nearly filled in. The only thing that is missing is the graph. If you notice here, we have 2 is less than x is less than 5. This is the inequality notation. Our set builder notation is read as the set of x. This line is read as such that. So we have the set of x such that 2 is less than x, which is less than 5. And then our interval notation, we have the interval between 2 and 5. Notice we use parentheses here. That's because there's no equal sign here on the inequalities. So this tells me that these values of 2 and 5 are not included. What does that look like on a graph? So let's fill in some values on our graph. I always like to go a few below and a few above. So I'll go to negative 1, 0, 1. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then take a moment and quickly fill that in for your other number lines since we'll be using them all. And 
it'd be a good practice to stack the numbers on top of each other. So if you notice, it looks pretty reasonable that all the negative ones are above each other, all the fives are above each other. And that's mostly to make your graphs easier to compare later on. So for this first graph, we want to start at the number two, which is here, but it's not included, so we draw a big open dot. And please, when you're doing your own work, make certain that you make your open dots very large and visible. It's really easy to draw this and think that's a closed dot. Now let's go over here to five and draw another large open dot, and let's connect them because we want to include all x values between 2 and 5. In our next example, we have 2 is less than or equal to. That extra little line is read as less than or equal to x, which is less than 5. In set builder notation, we would write the set of x such that 2 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 5. And then for interval notation, we still have 2 comma 5. 5 is not included, so it gets a parenthesis. But since 2 is included, it gets this bracket. So remember, this bracket coincides with the less than or equal to symbol. On our graph, we would start at 2. And this time, we can fill in our dot all the way because this filled in dot corresponds with this less than or equal to, which corresponds with this bracket. Now let's find 5 and draw our big open dot and connect the two. Next we have 2 is less than x, which is less than or equal to 5. So we would write the set of all x such that 2 is less than x is less than or equal to 5. And in interval notation, 2 is not included. So it gets a parenthesis, then we go to comma, and 5 gets a bracket, which is included. And now let's do our big open dot at 2, our closed dot at 5, and connect the two. So far, if you notice, all the graphs are completely stacked on another, on one another. The only difference is which ends are open and closed. The open ends tell us that this value is not included. That means if you had this little person walking over here in this direction. This little person can get infinitely close to two without ever touching two. So if you want to pause the video now, start walking towards a wall in your house or in your room and put your arm out. And imagine getting infinitely close to that wall here, but never touching it. And that's what that open dot represents. Whereas here, the closed dot represents you actually touching that wall. I'm going to get rid of this little person. Now, let's keep going. Here we have all values of x less than 5. So this represents all values of x less than 5. We write this as the set of all x such that x is less than 5. And in interval notation, we know our largest value is going to be 5. So that would be on the right of the comma. But what is our smallest value? Is it zero? Is it negative one? Is it negative a thousand, negative a million? All of those technically count, so we would write a negative infinity symbol. Let me redo that. The infinity symbol looks like a sideways eight. So imagine drawing a number eight and then rotating it so it's on its side. And that's how you get an infinity symbol. Let's graph this now. So we start at 5 with an open dot, and then we would go in this direction and then draw our arrowhead. And notice I didn't bother to go all the way to the end of the line. This arrowhead is enough information. This tells me this pink line goes on forever, infinitely, in the negative direction. Now let's look at x is greater than or equal to 2. We would write the set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to 2. 2 is our smallest value, so it's on the left of the parentheses. 
and we want our x's to be larger than 2. So we want to go out infinitely to the right in the positive direction, which would just be positive infinity. And again, just like you wouldn't write positive 1 to represent 1, we would just write 1. We don't need a positive symbol in front of the infinity. Just the infinity sign itself is enough to tell us that we're going in the positive direction. Now let's circle our 2. And we are going to fill it in, you notice, because we have the equals here. So let's color that in. And then draw our arrow off in this direction. And finally, we have all real numbers. This can be represented by the symbol, which is a bold face R. So you do two lines, a curve, and then connect them. So it's a bold face R. In interval notation, you'd write negative infinity to positive infinity with parentheses. And on our graph, we just want arrow going in two directions. So everything on this number line is included in this interval. So we just go off infinitely in two directions, in the negative direction and the positive direction. Okay, let's turn to page 8 of the required modules. And discuss tips for finding the domain of a function. The denominator of a fraction can never be what? The denominator of a fraction can never be 0. And the inside of an even root, by the way, when I say inside, this is just another word for radicand, or another way to describe the radicand. But the radicand of an even root can never be negative. So let's look at both of these. So let's look at example. Let's make a quick example one. If we had 2 over x, we know this x can never be 0. That is an undefined operation. Let's make another example here. So if I have the square root of x, I know that this x can never be negative. So we can have 4 be x in this case, and we get the square root of 4 is 2, but we cannot have negative 4 be x. With that, let's look at example 1. Finding the domain of a function. And then I am going to move this up so you will not be able to see what we just did above, but you do have your own notes in front of you to refer back to. So we're going to define the domain of these functions, express them as an inequality in set builder notation, and as an interval, and graph it on a number line. So here we have a fraction, for example, a. So I know this denominator cannot be 0. So when does this equal 0? Let's solve. 5 minus 2x equals 0. I'm going to add 2x to both sides. Then I have 5 equals 2x. Since negative 2x plus 2x is just 0, and 0 plus 2x is positive 2x. Now let's divide both sides by 2. We end up with x equals 5 over 2. So in inequality notation, let's do our inequality notation in red. I know that x cannot equal 5 halves. 
in interval notation, or sorry, set builder, let's do this one first in green, we have the set of x such that x is not equal to 5 halves. And now let's write this as an interval, and this will be kind of the longest one in general for problems like these. And I'm going to do these in purple. So we have negative infinity to 5 halves is one part of the interval. And we glue it together with what's called a union symbol. And we have 5 halves to infinity. And if we sketch out a quick number line right here, and uh, zeros here, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2. So here's my number line that shows all the visible pieces I need. 5 halves is the same as 2 and a half. You can try it on your calculator. And if need be, that's two and a half. So this is the one and only point that is not included, is right here. So that gets an open dot. And then I can just draw my arrows in either direction, since every other number is OK to plug in. The only undefined value here will be two and a half. Let's look at example B. We have a polynomial here in the denominator, and in order to figure out where f of x is undefined, we need to factor this denominator. And so it's assumed that you know how to factor from algebra, but if you're struggling on factoring, I would spend some time reviewing factoring techniques. So our numerator stays just as a 2, but our denominator factors as x minus 3 times x plus 1, because this will give us an x squared, an x, a negative 3x, negative 3x plus x is negative 2x, and negative 3 times 1 is negative 3. So now I know that x minus 3 times x plus 1 equals 0. Well, that's what I don't want to happen. So this only occurs if x minus 3 equals 0 or x plus 1 equals 0. We can write this as x equals 3 or x equals negative 1. Now for all of our solutions, as an inequality, this would be x not equal to 3 or x not equal to negative 1. In set builder notation, we'd have the set of x such that x is not equal to 3 and x is not equal to negative 1. As an interval, I would write, we want to go from negative infinity. The smaller of these two values is negative 1, so that comes next. Glue that together with a union. And we have negative 1 to 3, another union, and 3 to infinity. And let's take a look at the number line, because I think the number line will make it really clear why our interval notation looks the way it looks. So if I have negative 1 here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we'll go to 6. And then negative 2, negative 3. I'll stop there. So let's look at what this is. We know we don't want it to ever be 3, so I get an open dot there, and we don't want it to be negative 1. But this interval here, this left-hand side, is definitely valid in our domain. We can plug in negative 2 into this denominator and have a value that works out. So here, if you notice, I have the arrow going all the way to the left, which coincides to the negative infinity. I have my open dot at negative 1 here. And then I know all of these values in between are acceptable solutions. So here's my negative 1. 
and here's my positive 3. And then finally, I can go from positive 3 all the way out to positive infinity, and that's represented here. The open dot and the arrow represents 3 to positive infinity. And since I have 1, 2, 3 purple segment lines, I need to glue them together with 1, 2 union symbols, because I have 1, 2, 3 intervals. So I should have the same number of intervals as I have line segments. Let's do C and D. So I'm going to have to move my image a little lower, but you should still be able to reference your notes right above. Let's just get this all the way to the bottom of the page. So now I have radicals. This is 3 minus the square root of x. If you remember, this interior part is the radicand here. And here is my index. But we'll go more into that where it's relevant in B. So for now, we don't want this radicand to be negative. So I'm going to write 3 minus x is greater than or equal to 0. And then let's just solve this algebraically. So by adding x to both sides, we end up with 3 is greater than or equal to x. We can also rewrite this with the x on the left. Just focus here. Notice that the inequality is pointing to the x, so it should still be pointing to the x. And we have our equal sign under it and our 3. You can also think of it like the big alligator. This big alligator is hungry, and it's going to eat whichever value is larger. And here, it's eating the 3, because the 3 is bigger. So we want to make certain when we flip it, this big alligator, this big hungry alligator is still eating the 3. So we had to flip our inequality symbol to face the other direction. Now, this solution here is already written as an inequality. But let me rewrite it. So our inequality solution is x is less than or equal to 3. You could also write as 3 is greater than or equal to x. But typically it looks really nice when you write the x to the left. It's just easier to read. Also writing things so they go from smaller to larger is easier to read. Now in set builder notation, we have the set of x such that x is less than or equal to 3. And now the intervals here are a lot easier to write for these kinds of problems. Since we know our smallest value is going to be x and our largest value is going to be 3. So let me start with my 3 on the right because it's the largest value. Give it a bracket because it's included. And then I want to include every single value less than 3, every single real value. So I'd go to negative infinity. And now on my number line, I can quickly, let's see, go from negative 1, negative 2, oops, sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and let's put a negative 2 here. And I can sketch this out with the 3 as a closed dot and then go off to the left towards negative infinity. Finally, let's look at example D. Example D is the cube root of x minus 1. Now is a good time to review radical notation. The interior part here is called the radicand. And this number here is called the index. If you notice on example C, there was no index written here. Whenever you have a root with no index, you assume it's a 2. So this one has an index of 2. It's kind of like when we write positive numbers out. So on your 18th birthday, you would write, I'm 18 years old. 
you want to write I'm positive 18 years old. That would look kind of weird, that positive symbol. So we just don't write that way. In a similar manner, we've set a precedent to have a radicand with no index be defined as having an index of 2. So in the same way you don't include a positive in front of a value, a number, you don't have to include a radicand of 2. So let's finish up this example. Our index is 3. This is an odd-valued index. So what does that mean? So we have an index of 3, an odd number. Can we take the cube root of a negative number is a question. So let's look at a quick example. So let's try to take the cube root of negative 8. So take a moment and grab your calculator and see if you can figure this out. The cube root of negative 8. So now that you've used your calculator, you should have gotten a value of negative 2. What gives? I thought we couldn't have a negative in the radicand. So why is this the case? Notice that negative 2 cubed is negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. So this becomes a positive 4 times a negative 2, which is just a negative 8. So it is possible to have a negative radicand when you have an odd-valued index. So if this index was 5, 7, 13, 21, any odd number, you could have a negative radicand. That tells me that my domain is all real numbers. So here's a key concept. When the index of a radical is odd, the domain is always all real numbers, so from negative infinity to infinity. And I'm going to skip rewriting this as an inequality in set builder notation as an interval graphing because that was already done at the bottom of page 7 of your notes. And with that, I am concluding the first part of the video for section 1.2. The second part of the video will include some more domain and range examples along with piecewise functions.